service this morning. Just want you to join us in time of prayer. Obviously, we want to continue to pray uh, for our nation and some of the strife that we're going through at this time. So let's just spend some time in prayer as we begin this service. So you want to pray with, along with me and I'll pray silently. I'll give you a few moments to do that, and then I'll begin us in a time of prayer. So let's just take some time to pray. Father, our hearts are grieved at what is going on in our nation at this time and around the world, some of the struggles that we are facing with uh, all the different injustices and things that have taken place and the, and the hurt and the pain and the anger. And we just pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would have sway in the hearts and lives of your people. And we pray that today our focus would be not upon our own emotions, our own frustrations and our own difficulty, Father, but would be upon you, that we worship you in spirit and truth. And I pray that as we spend time in this service focusing, that our focus and our hearts and minds are shifted completely, fully towards what you desire to say to us today and who you are, that you might transform us and transform our culture. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us in for a time of worship. Good morning. So we're going to start with unchanging. And isn't it amazing how God is unchanging? So let's sing about it.
Well, good morning, and we are going to be looking at a very familiar psalm this morning, dealing with one of the names of God, Jehovah Rohi, who is, which means our shepherd. God is our shepherd, and it's in Psalm 23. I can't think of a better psalm to look at as we look at this name and what it means to us. And it's a psalm many of you are familiar with. You've probably spent many times reading. You've studied it. You've spent Bible studies uh, on it. Uh, of course, as a pastor, I've done many funerals, and this is one of the psalms that we close uh, almost every funeral I've ever done with. We, we usually have this psalm in it, and it's just it's a powerful psalm that speaks so much about who God is to us and the name that we're going to look at this morning. I hope it encourages you through times like these when we're a little bit challenged and we're a little bit frustrated and things are not the way we're used to them being, and we don't know how to handle that sometimes. We really struggle with that, and yet our shepherd knows what we need, and he walks with us in the middle of that. So I'm going to give you a chance to find Psalm 23 in your copy of God's Word. Many of you probably have it memorized, and uh, and may not need to even, even read it as I read along here. So Psalm 23, this is a psalm, of course, of David. And he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <clears throat> You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the King David as he penned these words many years ago and the struggles and things that he went through and how this psalm was a reminder of your presence and your comfort and your strength in his life. And we pray, Lord God, as we spend time in this word today, in this text, Father, you will speak to us in the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of wherever we find ourselves, knowing that you are with us. And as our shepherd, you guide us and you comfort us and go with us. We thank you for that and pray, Father, that today others are blessed and encouraged by what you desire to do in and through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as, you know, as I'm looking through the different names of God, this one, when I came to, to, to look at doing this one, there was just there actually were several texts in Scripture that I looked at, but this one just seems so fitting. And it's just kind of walking through the 23rd Psalm and what that means to us that Jehovah Rohi, and I'm probably mispronouncing that because I uh, am not really good at my Hebrew, but we'll just go with it for that for now. That is the name of the Lord, our shepherd. God is our shepherd. He is the one who comforts us. And we kind of know a little bit about shepherds because we've kind of heard messages about them and talked about studies, but most of us have not really encountered uh, what it, it's like to be around sheep. And of course, in this culture, it was a very significant uh, job, a livelihood for many people. Although shepherds themselves were not esteemed greatly because of you know, what they did, uh, but they were needed because shepherds, uh, sheep were a provision of food, they were a provision of, of the wool for their clothing, all different kinds of things. And yet, the men who took care of them, and men and boys who often spent time with the sheep, lived out with them and kind of were looked upon as outcasts of society. So it's kind of interesting that God would use this example, and this name, as one to demonstrate his care and his character. And we also know that King David, before he became King David, was a shepherd. Uh, his uh, family had some sheep, and that was his job as the youngest child, to go out there and take care of the sheep. And he tells some stories, obviously, about some things that took place out there. And I can imagine what it must be like by himself as a young man out there in the dark, uh, with those sheep and wondering about some things that were going on and hearing all those noises uh, that were out there and knowing that uh, he was the one to protect these animals in the midst of whatever came their way to come and destroy them. And I think as we look at that, this helps us understand who God is as our shepherd. So just kind of just some introductory things just to think about there as we talk about it and then we move in now to this text and kind of walk through what it means and what David, I think, is trying to say to us in these moments. So once again, he, he starts this, this, ver this text off by saying that the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is the one who cares for me. The Lord is the one who watches over me. The Lord is the one who leads me. He's not who I want. He's not what I don't want to follow him. And it, that's the, you know, if you've ever been around, as I said, sheep, sheep are not really good. Uh, they, they're not, they don't have a lot of strong self-initiative. Self if, if it's left up to them, they will not take care of themselves. They're not the brightest animals in the barnyard. Let's just be honest. And yet the scriptures again and again, God uses sheep to talk about his people. I'm going to let that one stay with you for a few moments knowing that he compares us to sheep. That, and you see in our world today, in our culture, that people are very much like sheep. They can be driven quite easily. They can go in directions that they don't ordinarily go simply to follow after others. And we're really good at, with a herd mentality in our culture, aren't we? We follow after others. And I think there's an illustration in the church as well for us that we have to be uh, cognizant of that and careful that we understand that 
The one shepherd that we follow, it's not the pastor that you follow. It's not your other church members that you follow. It's not other, the latest whatever. You follow the Lord God of heaven. He is our shepherd. He is the leader. He is the one who cares for us. And there's some characteristics about the shepherd we're going to walk through here that I think will help us understand God's role in our lives and what God, I think, meant as, as it was trying to get across about who he was for us. And we kind of go back against again to David and our understanding of what it was like for a shepherd. Caring for those sheep. The shepherd's, desire, the shepherd's purpose was to care for, watch over the sheep because they were his livelihood. He has to make sure they are safe, make sure they are protected. And in the, the wilderness of that day, there, there are things, there are other people. People would come to try to steal the sheep if they, could, if they were left alone. The sheep could wander off. Or there were animals that would seek to kill them. Wolves and other things that would come to seek to kill the sheep. And so they would, the shepherd would protect them. And that's why the shepherd has a staff. And a lot of people have you know, seen pictures of the shepherd's staff. It was a, a large staff with a hook on it. And the hook was when the sheep, sheep had gone astray to pull them back. And the staff was, it was a great weapon when you needed to fend off a wild animal or someone that was coming after it. It was something that you could use. It was an offensive weapon. And we sometimes think of shepherds as being these you know, meek little people that just kind of sit out there waiting and watching over the sheep. And yet they're on watch. And God is trying to remind us through David's word here that God is on watch. God is protecting us. He is watching over his children. And he knows what is best for them. And he knows where they need to go. It's like sheep don't really know where they need to graze and where they can get water. The shepherd leads them to that. God does that with us, doesn't he? We think we know what is best for us. We think we know where we need to go and all that we need to do. We think we can just take care of ourselves. But yet, oftentimes, we find ourselves in a difficult situation because we think we know better than we really do. And I think David is alluding to this here when he talks about him making me lie down in green pastures. He doesn't say he takes me to green pastures. He makes me lay there and rest. He puts me down there. He makes sure that I can rest there and that I have a place to nourish myself, to take care of myself, to provide for my needs. And God is amazing at that in our lives. He knows where to place us. He knows where to put us. He knows what we need, not just physically, but what we need emotionally, what we need spiritually in our lives, what we need to sustain us, to strengthen us. And he gives us what we need to help us on the journey of our lives. And I think this is something that sometimes it's easy to forget of God's provision for us, that God is, is one that knows, as we've talked about before, God knows our journey. He knows where we are going. He understands all things. And in uncertain times like these, and you know when you think about it, all times are pretty uncertain, aren't they? We really never know what's going to happen from one day to the next. It's just the stress of what is going on in our world right now causes a lot of people a great deal of angst, a lot of frustration. They're trying to figure out what's going to happen. You know, what, what, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to handle this? What's going to take place in America today as, with all that we see? And I think many people are expressing their frustration and their anger and their angst in some very negative ways. What we saw take place this week, we saw something horrific when a man was, was basically uh, before our eyes uh, was murdered and it was in, in a very unjust way. It was a horrible thing that took place. And then all the pieces of justice that are slow to move began to go in the process of working through that process. And of course, we as people are impatient, aren't we? We want things to happen at our speed not at the speed that they happen. And we get frustrated with that. And so that's why I think we've seen some of the things that have gone on in our culture. And while protests are not wrong, riots are. And the violence that's taken place in our country as a result of this is as deplorable as the actions that took place that day when that gentleman's life was snuffed out. And the same is true for us in our lives. We can get to look at God and say, God, are you going to provide justice now? Are you going to move in my life now? Are you going to do what needs to be done? Are you going to act now? And God's like, I will act in accordance with my own time. You will never force God's hand to do what God wants to do. He will do it in, in accordance with his timing. And he will take care of his children. And he will watch over lead us on the path that he has for us. And we must trust him in that. And that's what's interesting that as he compares to the sheep, because sheep are very trusting of the shepherd. They go where the shepherd leads them. They do what the shepherd tells them to do because they're followers and also really they have no choice, but they know that it's best. They know the shepherd knows better than they do what is best for them. And let me say this for each of us. God knows better than we do what is best for us. Sometimes we get all caught up and wrapped up in what we think is best, and we are great at analyzing and looking at life and, and saying, this is what I know, this is what works best for me. And then God does something in our lives that we don't expect and we don't, expect and we don't like. I don't know if that's ever happened to any of you. It happens to me quite regularly. And he reminds me that you are not the one in control, Michael. I'm in control. I know what we will do. I know what is best. Trust me and follow me and let me lead you on the path that I have for you. And that's what we see here in this text, that the shepherd, the good shepherd, 
Our Creator, our Savior, our Redeemer is the one who takes us and lays us down where we need to, gives us a place of rest, gives us a place of nourishment, gives us a place of protection and encouragement. Because a lot of times what we do, though, at least in my mind, and maybe some of the rest of you struggle with this, is we kind of we kind of do these what-if scenarios in our lives, and like, what if this happens, what if that happens, and we get all caught up in the what-ifs that might happen. We build these, these scenarios. I, I, you know, a friend of mine who was in the military for many years calls it the worst-case scenario. And we build that up in our mind, and we kind of go overboard, and this is what's going to happen. We think this is how it's going to work out, and, and it could happen. But generally, most of the things that we build up is they're going to be horrible things that are going to happen in our life never take place. And we build up all this stress and all this anxiety and all these things that come in and grip us and, and take away our energy and take away our strength to live sometimes over things that never, ever happen. And the good shepherd, the shepherd of our souls, the shepherd who watches over us, knows what's taking place and knows how to walk with us through that. Instead of fearing things that don't really affect us, he wants us to trust him. When I was a smaller child, I, I used to like to watch scary movies. Now, when I say scary movies, this was back in the 70s, so this was not the kind of scary movies that have slashers and things. It was, you know, like Dracula, you know, the old one in black and white, or Frankenstein with Boris Karloff. And I used to watch those. I used to like to watch those old movies or some of those old B uh, sci-fi movies that would show up. We had a channel in the place where I grew up that would show those regularly. And so I'd watch those movies. And occasionally those movies have some images. Now, I know today when you think of that's that's not scary. That's comical. You know, that's why a lot of people are like, that's not even scary. But when you're, you know, six, seven, eight years old, pretty easy to get scared about some things. And I, you know, you, I would watch these. And occasionally I would get some nightmares, especially, especially the Wolfman. That one really bothered me. I don't know why. Just the transformation and all that, you know, was one of those things. And but uh, most of you don't even know what I'm talking about. You can probably find it on YouTube or somewhere out there. You can find the movies. They're old. They've been around forever. But those things used to scare me. And I remember I was, I was kind of getting that. I was having some nightmares about some of the things I was seeing. And so uh, my mother then told me I couldn't watch those movies anymore. You know how that went over. But uh, so I try, they tried to help me understand the reality that those things are fiction. They are things you're not to be fair of. There's are stories. They're not true. It's an imagination that someone had that created this monster. It's not real, so there's no need to fear it. And, that, and, and over time, I understood that's what it was. And then I became an adult, and I realized there were other things to be fearful of, wasn't there? There are a lot of things that are a lot scarier than any monster in any movie could ever be in our lives. And many people are dealing with that right now. Our own mortality scares us to death. We wonder what's going to happen, and what, where are we going to be? What, you know, how many days do I have left? What will happen to my family if I'm gone? All these things run through our mind. All these different fears and anxieties grip us and keep us focused upon. And, and we do, we just focus upon them and we dwell on them. And then we get frustrated and we get fearful because we don't know how to handle them. And what I believe this text is reminding us is that you're not in control of your life anyway. I hope all of us understand that. You have no control over your days. You can live them a little more safely and better, but none of us know that we have tomorrow. We're making plans for this afternoon. Many of you, you know, when we were come to church together, you know, we, we make plans for lunch, and that's good, but, you know, we don't know that we have lunch. We don't know what we have. We don't know what the future holds. We have no idea. We think we do. We kind of have a pretty good expectation because of what's always happened, but sometimes things don't always happen the way they always happen because that's the way life is. But there is one who's already there, there is one who knows what's going to happen. There is one who wants to walk with us in the middle of our circumstances and says, child, let, just, just hang on to my hand, go with me, and I will take you on this path that I have for you. Why do we refuse that? Why do we think, well, God, I don't need you. I can do this myself. And the reality is, no, we really can't do it ourselves. That's why we need him. What our culture needs now is not anything. We don't need better politics. We don't need uh, better safety. We need God. We need the Lord God of heaven in our lives. We need, a, we need intervention. We need, we need a great awakening. We need to trust in him instead of focusing on ourselves and focusing on our problems and focusing on the things around us and letting all of that just engulf our minds. We need to trust the shepherd, the good shepherd as he's described here. David understood what it was like to be scared. He understood what it was like to be defenseless to be beyond himself, to be where, even with all his expertise and experience, and he was a warrior, and he'd, he'd, he'd done a lot of things in his life and knew how to handle it, but there were situations that even he struggled to handle, and he knew that in the middle of that, if he turned his trust to God and allowed God to lead him, he could handle any situation, and God could lead him as he desires. And the same is true for us today, isn't it? 
We face some scary times. We face some challenges. We face some difficulties. But God is bigger than those difficulties and challenges. We believe that. We, we talk about that. We sing about that. And now our faith, brothers and sisters, is being tested. Do we truly believe that God is able to walk with us through this? Will we trust him? Will we choose faith or will we choose fear? Will we choose to give in to all the anxiety and all the struggle and all the things that get in our way that say, oh, I can't, no, no it's, it's too much for me. Yes, it is too much for you. Much of the things that we face in our lives that we put upon ourselves are too much for us, and that's part of our problem because we think we're all self-sufficient and we can handle whatever we can handle, and whatever we can really handle is a lot more limited than we want to give ourselves credit for. We really don't do as well as we think we can with stress. We don't like change in our culture, do we? People are terrified of change in so many ways. We want things to stay the way we like them, the way it works for us. I'm sure the sheep are like that as well. You know, they're just going along grazing and just doing their thing. And they're full. I'm full. It's time for a nap. That sounds like a great life, doesn't it? But anyway, the shepherd guides them. He knows what they need. He knows they need to go to get some water. He knows they need to, to rest. But they just can't. He can't just drive them continually, and they're going to go for hours on end, and eventually, if he does that, they will die. He has to help them understand that. And our creator, our, our good shepherd, is able to do that with us. He's walking us through life, and we have to learn to trust him and trust his hand and let him lead us. And even though sometimes we think, God, why are you doing this? It isn't very comfortable. I don't really like it. We have to trust the knowledge and the wisdom of the shepherd, don't we? Because he always knows better. And brothers and sisters, he will take you on the path that he has for your life. And right now, while you're going through all this uncertainty and while our culture is struggling with this, it's a very good time for us as believers to realize that we know the good shepherd and we know the one who is going to walk with us and strengthen us through this time and help us to understand what is going on. Because he guides us. I love that, set, that third verse. He, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. He knows the way for me. He has a path for me. And it's all done for his glory, for his namesake. And when I'm tired, when I'm weary, when I don't know what I want, as it says there in verse 3, he restores me. He encourages me. He lifts me up. He reminds me of who he is. And we, take our, we gain our restoration in Christ when we worship him. When we understand we get our perspective off of our problems and we focus our attention and our spirit on, one, on the one that truly matters and the one that, is, that transcends everything we experience and is beyond what we can imagine. And as we worship him, we begin to experience his presence. And he gives us a faith and he gives us a confidence and he gives us a courage that we do not have in our own. You see, being a shepherd would, would require some courage because there are times shepherds had to face, as we mentioned earlier, some wild animals or people that were seeking to cause harm and they had to stand up for their sheep on behalf of the sheep because the sheep couldn't do it themselves. And our shepherd stands up for us, which is why that verse 4, which is one that gets quoted a lot and misquoted a lot, but also speaks greatly to what we're able to endure no matter what. I want to read it again. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I'm tough, right? Because I can handle it. No. Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The shepherd is with me. I know who walks with me. I'm not fearful because I have this great courage and this great boldness and I have these great tools and abilities to overcome whatever I can overcome. And maybe I do. But there are eventually going to come things in life that even the things that you think you have, the abilities and skills that you believe you can have to overcome any situation will fail you. There, the thing, you will face something that is beyond your ability to overcome. And that's why we need to trust in the shepherd. That no matter what we go through, because as we walk through the valley of the shadow, there's no need to fear as he is with us. If it be our end, it's our end. And if we're his child and it's our end, then it's just a new beginning. We are going home with him, and we, just, we know that. We, we, we talk about that loosely, but do we really understand that? That he is the one that walks with us, that no matter what we face, he is with us. Whether we face life, death, suffering, whatever we go through, the God of heaven walks with us, David says here. And he uses that imagery, the valley of the shadow. And you think, well, that's, that's kind of nice that he put that in there. It's got a nice ring to it. But you understand that this guy knew what he's talking about here. If you read through the text where he, you know, where he was king, before he was king, he was being chased and hunted down by the guy he was replacing. And Saul and his men tried to kill David and his men. Many times had opportunities, and, and he, he experienced that. And then through some of his own mistakes in life, he created an issue with his son that he didn't handle appropriately, and then his own son sought to kill him. And so David was a hunted man for many, at many points in his life. So he understood what it meant. When he says the valley of the shadow of death, it's when the enemy's about to pounce and destroy you. And even in the middle of that, I know that you will walk with me and I trust you in the middle of that. 
And some of you today are facing challenges like that. Maybe it's news from a doctor that you heard about an illness that you have that you didn't expect, and you're, you're walking through the valley of the shadow. Maybe it's a situation in your family where you're dealing with a child that's not, that, that is having some struggles or a family member that's dealing with some really difficult issues, and you don't know how to walk through that. Understand the shepherd walks with you in the valley of the shadow. It is his presence with us that gives us comfort, that gives us hope, and gives us courage to walk through. And I don't know about you, but I think we desperately need this in the church of Jesus Christ today. We need courage. We need comfort. We need hope. We need to understand that the shepherd is with us. And then these last couple of verses, just a few moments I want to spend on that just kind of present an interesting picture. I like word pictures. I don't know how you are about that, but I do like word pictures. I like the way people can craft a word picture. I wish I was better at it. David has the ability to do this here as he writes in this psalm when he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now, I don't know how it is for you, but when I'm going to go out to dinner, I'm probably not going to want to go to dinner with people that don't like me. How about you? Most of us don't want to do that. That seems strange. Why would he say that? And yet the idea of preparing a table, being in the presence of an enemy, is, is, is this is an idea of exaltation. This is an idea of you're going to be honored because you are placed at the seat of honor is what he's talking about here. In the presence of your enemies, I will exalt you. I will honor you up and I will protect you. I will be the one that even in the middle of your mess, even in the middle of those who seek to destroy you, I'm the one who prepares that table for you. I'm the one that, who exalts you. I'm the one who honors you and encourages you. That's what that idea of the table is. You will literally eat in their presence. You will be there with those who seek to destroy you, and you will be the one who is protected and exalted and lifted up because of who God is. Because of, it's not because you're a good person. Understand that. It's not because of anything that you've done. It's simply because of the presence of the shepherd, the presence of God with you as he walks with you. And he anoints our head with oil. That is that idea that he sets us apart for his purposes and his plans. David understood that as king. We need to understand that as followers of Jesus Christ. We have been anointed and set apart for a purpose, and that is to exalt our Savior and to take the gospel to the nations. That is why we are still here. Everything we do as a church is not, it should never be about us. When it becomes about us, we're no longer a church, we're a club, and we need to close the doors. We need to be about taking the gospel to the nations. And the nations are all around us here in Frederick. We need to be about serving our community, about taking, showing the love of Christ to others. But when it gets all about me and all about us, then I have lost sight of what it means to be a follower of Christ, and I've lost sight of what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. Because you are anointed and called out for a purpose. And in the middle of all that you face, as David says, all the things that I, as I, I've struggled with, all the failings that I've had, all the frustrations that I realize and I look at my life, my cup overflows. I am abundantly blessed beyond my imagination. God has blessed me in more ways than I can fully articulate. And I'm thankful. So we see out of all these things as he describes it, he sees as towards the end of this psalm, he's beginning to see that God is indeed good and God is indeed gracious. And God has done for him things that he does not deserve, and he is thankful. And I wonder if we see that in the middle of a mess like this in our world, with all the struggles that we face and all the challenges that we endure as the church and as people, God is with us, God is before us, God goes with us, and God desires to do something in us and through us that maybe we never expected before that might be better than anything we've ever imagined. You know, when are things going to get back to normal? We hear it all the time. Never. It'll be a different kind of normal than it was. That's okay. And we need to adjust to that, and we need to prayerfully. I don't think we want to go back to the way things were, because as the church, the way things were weren't working anyway, so I want to go back there for. I don't understand that. We were not being what we were needed to be, and I think maybe this is what God is using this time in our culture, in our world, to help us as the church understand our mission and refocus on our mission, that our mission is to take the good news to those who haven't heard it. That our mission is to seek to make a difference in the lives of our families and our children for the sake of the kingdom, that everything is about exalting Christ in my life, that he is truly Lord and master of my life, that he is the one who I want to serve, the one whom I want to honor, the one who my life, I I want it to count not for me but for him. I want him to make his name great through this life he's given me. And after all David says about this shepherd and his walk with him, he ends it in that very famous sixth verse that speaks with such power about what God has done. And he's probably, who knows when this was written? Nobody knows if this was written when. I mean, that's the one thing about the Psalms. We know they're written by David. Some that that he wrote were written by him. We just don't know when he wrote them. 
what was the timing. They can guess and try to figure out, but it doesn't really give a clue here. But I can imagine probably as he ended towards the end of his life, he probably thought of this, this right that he wrote. He said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I have been blessed, and so have you and I. The goodness and mercy of God have overwhelmed us all the days of our life, and the hope that we have, that he had and we have as followers of Christ, is that when this life comes to an end, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We will spend time with our master and our creator forever. In the place that he has prepared for us, we will be with him. And the good shepherd understands us and knows us. And he knows that this life is short. And it's not always going to go according to plan. And most of us have lived long enough to know that all of our plans, all the things that we thought would happen and we hoped would happen, don't always happen the way we want them to, do they? Some things that as, much as, as, as hard as we try and as, as much as we agonize and organize and, and do all the right things, sometimes things just don't work out the way we think they should. And what you and I have to do as followers of Christ understand that's okay because the shepherd is with us. He never said we'd be happy. He never said we'd, everything would go well. He never said everything was going to be perfect for you in a way that you define perfection. What he did say is that I will be with you. And we hear that resonate again here in this text. And in the middle of all that, David understands that. And he knows that. And I'm sure it's hard at times to apply. And it's hard at times for us to wrap our heads around that when we're, things aren't going the way we want them to. But we need to be mindful that in the middle of whatever we find ourselves, God is good. God is faithful. And God is present. No matter how harsh and difficult a circumstance you may find yourself in, He is good. And He is present. I had an interesting experience at the hospital in my training this week that I just had to share because it was just a, you know, occasionally you meet people in those kind of circumstances, I, I don't know. I know the woman was a believer because she told me that and she shared that and shared her faith and she was talking about her life and she pretty much has been given whatever. She never told me and I don't have to know what's wrong with a person. You know, that's, what, that's between her and her doctor. I'm not a doctor, not a physician, can't fix it anyway, so what do I need to know? But she said they had told her that she didn't have much time left. And uh, we were just talking and I was just listening. So that's, I said, that's, that's horrible news. That's difficult news. She said, it's okay. It's okay. I know where I'm going. I know in whose hands I'm in. I'm afraid for my, she said, I'm afraid for my husband. I don't know how he's going to take care of himself with me gone, but I know God will provide. And that's the scariest. She said, that was, she was more scared of that than anything else. She wasn't afraid of dying because of her faith and understanding that that was a part of life that was going to happen. And I, her, her faith was such an encouragement to me in those moments because here's a woman facing death. I mean, we all face death technically every day, I know, but sometimes it's more real for others because of what the doctor says, right? And some of you have experienced that and may experience, we're all eventually going to experience it anyway. I mean, we, we think, well, that's going to happen to somebody else, but I'm going to get, no. Every one of us, it's there. It's a reality. It's that, it's that dark thing over in the corner of the room that you want to ignore, but it happens to all of us. And this woman was, it was not just in the room, it was staring her in the face. And I was so encouraged by her faith because that was what she was leaning on in that moment. It wasn't talking about how good a person she was. She said, I just, she kept saying, I know how faithful my Savior is. And I know what he has promised me in his word and what he will do. And I know that when I end, this life comes to an end that I'll be with him. And then I'll probably forget about all that stuff. She said, I'll probably forget about all this stuff. And I said, you probably will. God will take that away. But that kind of, that really, that was one of the, that was one of the last, last visit I had. Thursday night, and it was such an encouragement to spend some time with this woman and pray with her. She, she wanted me to pray and just spend some time, and we just sat there. I sat, she, she laid there. I, I sat there in the room and just felt extremely blessed to have been in her presence for a few moments. And it reminded me so much of this text. It comes a point in my life I am not in control anymore. I have to come to grips with that reality, and so do you. And if you haven't, brothers and sisters, life will eventually show you how little control you have. But the good news is there is one who is able to walk with you through that lack of control, that frustration, that terror, that thing that just causes you to shrink back and wonder, I don't know what to do, and he is present with you. He is the shepherd. 
He can fight off any enemy. And sometimes He can just hold you when you need to be held. And I think so many in our world today need to understand that there is a God who loves them beyond human understanding. There's a God who cares for them in ways that they don't even know is possible. And the job that you and I have as followers of Jesus Christ is to share that message with them. To demonstrate the hope in word and in deed that God loves you and God is in control. I know it looks like chaos out there. And like you, my heart is burdened for many places, including the city of my birth that's going through a nightmare right now. It's going all over the place. But I know whom I have believed and am sure that he is able to deliver me in that day. And the same is true for you if you're his child. He will care for us. And we can trust him. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you. I thank you that no matter what I face, no matter what we deal with in this life, no matter how dark the day appears and how difficult the times may seem to be, oh God, you are faithful. You are good. And I pray, Lord, that through this time as we spend time just listening to some songs, a song sung, and we're reminded in our spirits of who you are, that we just seek to trust you a little bit more with the life that we've been given and the days that we have. And rather than analyze and agonize, we instead seek you and let you lead us. <clears throat> Thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for being with us no matter what we face. Thank you, Lord, when I'm afraid for taking me up in your arms and holding me tight. There are days that come that we cannot get through on our own. No matter how tough we pretend to be, there are things that are beyond our ability that we cannot overcome. Help us to learn to trust. Bless this time and use it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If this is the time we have in our service, if we're gathered together, where we would have an invitation. If God has spoken to you, let me encourage you. If you need to talk to someone, feel free to send me an email or send a, put a message there in the in the chat room, we'll be back to get back to you as soon as we can and be happy to pray with you and have a way God can minister to you. So as we sing this song together, let our spirits be reminded of the God and the great shepherd that we serve.
much for joining us today. We hope that God has used this time to encourage you and strengthen you in your walk with him. Just want to give you some announcements, also a prayer request. Uh, Paul Gianni's mother passed away this weekend, so we want to pray for the Gianni family as they go through that time of, of grief uh, and that difficult loss. Also want to remember, uh, uh, I would encourage, if you could tonight, we've got the uh, one award ceremony, I believe, is going on at 5.30 tonight, and it's going to be outside in the parking lot. So i uh, be praying for that as they gather and kind of celebrate. It'll be very brief, kind of get your awards and go. So that's kind of, I think, the plan that they've got lined up for that. We'll be praying for that. And so they celebrate uh, what those uh, students have done, an amazing thing they've done with Scripture, continue to do that even through the process of all this mess. Uh, how their parents and others have been working with them to kind of get their, their books completed. So we wanna, they'll be celebrating that. So we'll be praying for them as they do that. Also, tonight at 7, I'm going to do a live stream of a prayer meeting for our nation. Just a brief time. We're going to spend some time. Brief time in God's Word, mostly some time praying for America and the things that we're going through as a nation right now. So I want to do that at 7 o'clock. That'll be on the live stream. You'll, you'll see that tonight. And also, the big announcement that we have is we're going to come together. We're going to try to come together next Sunday for one service at the 1045 service. We're going to be, space is limited, obviously, because we have to do all the stuff. Uh, they have to do the social distancing. We'll give you more details. Please check out the website. You'll probably get an email on that. Uh, it'll be then sent out later on the phone tree if that actually works this week. And all that stuff to get to you. Uh, so you have that information so you know what to, what to bring in to be a part if you'd like to be a part of that. Otherwise, I know there's still many of you that have expressed to me you do not feel comfortable coming, and that is perfectly fine. We will still do the live stream and join us in that, uh, that venue, and our hope is to continue the live stream even after this is all over. That'll be another way we'll continue to do that. So we want to make sure you feel safe in that way, and we'll, we'll provide that in every atmosphere for, for you in that. So we, we just pray that you pray for us as we prepare for that. It's a big it, you wouldn't think how hard it is. We used to do it all the time, but now it's a big adjustment coming to do that with all the different rules and, and uh, things and trying to be concerned about your safety that take place uh, in different ways than we had to do before. So pray for us as we prepare for that. But that is the plan. There'll be more about that in the days ahead. So I think that's all I got for you. So you have a great week.